Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? This is a program where we are vitally interested in the Bible. I have to say that each evening because that is the fact. It is a unique program in which we look at the Bible as what it really is, namely the Word of Almighty God, the very Word that God who created this complex and beautiful universe gave to us so that in black and white, in words and in sentences and paragraphs, we can begin to know something about God's will for our lives. It is absolutely unique, a unique book. It is the most important book in the world. God did not write it, however, to be easily understood. It's a book that we have to... The instructions within it say that we are to compare spiritual things with spiritual. And the whole Bible is spiritual. That means before we arrive at a conclusion concerning any teaching of the Bible, we want to make sure that we are in harmony with anything else within the Bible. Not, not in harmony with what we think is reasonable in our minds, but in harmony with what is in the Bible so that we know that we have truth. And for that reason, a program like this is wonderful because we can continually fine-tune. If, we, uh, if we're not really, uh, or if we emphasize a doctrine and we're doing it a little bit incorrectly, uh, others can bring up verses that still have to be incorporated into the uh, into an understanding so that we do find true harmony. Wonderfully, as we develop one doctrine after another and they are in, they are really true, we'll find more, greater and greater harmony. And we'll also find that, uh, therefore, we are, are truly finding the truth of what the Bible is teaching, and that is all important, particularly as we teach the Word of God. We, it is a terrible, terrible crime, a terrible sin to say, Thus saith the Lord, because we think we know what the Bible says, when the Lord has not said, when we haven't done our homework properly, when we haven't really checked it out, and we end up teaching something contrary to what the Bible is teaching, then it becomes a big fat lie. It becomes something that's abhorrent to God. It means that we are, are using the name of the Lord to teach something that is not from the Lord at all. And it is a dreadful, dreadful sin. Now, we get calls from uh, uh, many places in the world... We are letters. Uh, we have a listener in China. This listener uh, is very appreciative of what she is hearing on the open forum and uh, uh, thanks us for our teaching. And then she has a pro question, very practical question. Right now, we are facing a very difficult situation that I hope you can help us with. There are mostly women and children in the village and in our fellowship. No man can lead us during the worship. In this situation, only women can stand up and lead the worship and teach. Do you think this is appropriate? If not, how should we do? Well, this is one of the problems. We're living in a day where God does not call for, in any sense for us to, meet, to be meeting together as a group of believers in a fellowship of any kind. We, we are, that is not a mandate, a command that God gives us. He talks about it in Hebrews 10, verse 25, we're not to neglect the assembling of ourselves but with whom 
do we assemble? With whom do we assemble? It doesn't say that we assemble with others. Now, it's true that our Bibles, uh, the translators said that we are to encourage or exhort one another, but that one another is not in the in the original language. It really means to exhort or comfort ourselves. And how are we to comfort ourselves? There's a beautiful statement in Second Thessalonians chapter two, uh, 1, or chapter 2, rather, uh, verse 16 and 17. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself... And God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Notice how God is underscoring our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, that uh, comports with what we read in 1st John chapter 1 1st John chapter 1 where God declares there in verse 3 uh, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son Jesus Christ that is the situation of today no it's not saying that we would be wrong in fellowshipping with others But we have to be careful. That is not what God is requiring. Uh, It is a time when we have no trust in anyone except God himself. And God has given us the textbook. He has given us the law book, the Bible, the Bible. And it therefore is a time when it is God and me, God and me, our fellowship is with God himself. Now, it is true that as long as the church age has has gone along, and that's a long time, of course, uh, and many of us have been trained in the local congregations, we were trained to have fellowship one with another and to rely on other people for help. But the fact is, the real help can never come from another person. It can, the real wisdom can never come from another person. It comes from God. And there's nothing more wonderful than go to God. Now, it doesn't mean that we have to become tremendous students of the Bible in order for God to speak to us, because God does speak to us through his word. But it does mean that we again and again can implore God, go directly to him. Oh, God, I don't know anything. Oh, Lord, I need instruction. Oh, Lord, I I want to do your will, and our, I don't know what to do in this situation. And we simply lean back on his almighty arms. We simply wait upon him. We have to learn more and more. It's me and God, me and God. Now, it is true that if uh, a few people come together to study the Bible uh, and men are present, it is not at all wise. The Bible says a woman is not to teach or have authority over men. It's not at all wise for a man, for a woman to lead the discussion if there's going to be some uh, leadership, uh, some uh, teaching there. It would be, it should be a man. Now, suppose no men are present. Well, then it it can be a woman if no men are present. But if men are present, then uh, either you should wait and be praying that, that a man might show up who would be qualified to guide. But above all, uh, don't don't uh, think that you have to have somebody there to teach you. Uh, if you meet together, uh, look together into the Word of God and and pray, uh, pray that God will open your spiritual eyes and and you, you can you can just try to uh, between your the women that are present there, the individuals there uh, struggle with a verse, looking for 
truth, but waiting upon God to lead you into truth. Let me repeat again. Our fellowship is with the Lord Jesus. And as a matter of fact, there's a problem with fellowships. There are two serious problems. And that's why uh, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, personally, a little bit concerned or nervous about this. First of all, an individual can come in who's quite dynamic, quite charming, and, and appears to really know the Bible, and can begin to teach things that are contrary to the Bible. And uh, in other words, you become a prey of, of uh, wrong teaching. Secondly, it is very easy to make that fellowship kind of a pseudo-church. Oh, yes, you don't want to be a church. Uh, and yet the next thing, you have someone there who wants to exercise some kind of spiritual leadership and, and really uh, control uh, the whole situation uh, spiritually. And so without realizing, you're moving toward becoming what a a local church really is and you don't want to move in that direction at all so uh, while uh, fellowship is not contrary to the word of God it has to be handled exceedingly carefully ca exceedingly carefully that it does not become a a, a pseudo uh, semi church of some kind but May God give you wisdom, but above all, learn, each of us who are true believers, we have to learn to sit with our Bibles and worship God as individuals or as a family with you and your children, you and your husband if he's willing to sit down, or your wife if, will, if she's willing to sit down with you. This is the way, this is the best thing that, I could suggest. But thank you, China, for that good question. And shall we take our first call on our telephone lines? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Mr. Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Mr. Camping, uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'm not going to ask you any questions tonight. It's been a long time left since I called you. I have a petition. Uh, I am from Brazil, uh, I speak Portuguese, um, I live in Melbourne right now. Is there any way, I, I would like to hand out tracts, the God Logic tracts on Sunday, but actually I don't like to do it by myself. Is there a way or, uh, that I can find someone through family radio, like a partner? Well, uh, I, I don't, uh, your question is that you'd like to spend Sunday passing out Does God Love You tracks? Yes, but not by myself. I, w I wonder if Family Radio provides, uh, I don't, you know, I, uh, any way I can find like somebody who listens to Family Radio who believes well, I do. Well, you, you know, the, again, uh, uh, we we have no way of, of controlling this in your life or assisting you in your life, except that we're willing to furnish whatever tracks you need. But what's to keep you from standing out in the marketplace, wherever it might be, on the street corner, or at the bus station, or uh, uh, where, wherever it might be, and and just offering the Does God Love You track to whoever comes by. You don't want to force it on anybody. Maybe in our country there isn't that great an interest in the gospel as there is in some other countries. And it may be that only one out of three people will even take a track. But when they, when they do, if they do take one, well, just think in your heart now, uh, maybe that person took that track because God is going to do a work of grace in their heart. Well, you don't know, but just be thankful that that person took that track. And, and you now in some cases you might uh, pass out ten tracks uh, and you'll find that three of them were thrown on the ground afterwards. Well, go ahead, pick them up, and if they were damaged, destroy them. But on the other hand, I don't feel 
and you remember the the uh, opposition to the gospel is not opposition to you the opposition is to God himself and God has to open the door and so you just I uh, just be there volunteering the track to whoever might take it you don't even have to say a word uh, to the, uh, an individual someone might speak to you about it and give you a chance to talk about the Lord Jesus but maybe that won't happen either but in the meanwhile at least you know that you are doing exactly what the role of the true believer is namely to send the gospel out into the world yeah I, I did I, in the beginning of the year I went to Rio where you know I, I feel very comfortable over there and I gave like 500 in, in fact was very well accepted, uh, but here, you know, uh, I don't feel very comfortable doing by myself. But anyway, and the last question I have is a petition: is uh, since you're sending groups to different countries, I mean, if you have a chance to think about sending a group, a small group, to Rio, so that's just a petition I would like you. Uh, Rio de Janeiro. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think we did have a. Uh a track group there um, some years ago and maybe in time we'll send another one but uh, our our uh, uh, mission uh, committee that works on that can take that adv under advisement but we certainly want to reach any of the larger cities of the world and Rio is certainly a good place again to send out missionaries to yeah, I'm planning to go again, God willing, next year. I already have my 500 uh, that I asked in Portuguese. You know, like I said, I already have my 500, no problem. But here, well, okay, just take thank that in consideration. You thank know, you. Uh, thank thank you. you. Yeah, and thank you so much for calling. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I just had a couple of questions uh, relating to the book of Genesis. Go ahead um, with your question. When when the animals were in the garden with Adam and Eve, they were in the garden with them at, uh, the, at the same time, or was it a separate time? Oh, the Bible doesn't emphasize that at all. The Bible simply says that well, first of all, you have to remember the whole world was a beautiful, perfect world because God had created everything and everything was very good. Fact is, we're surprised that uh, God talks about a Garden of Eden because how can you be more beautiful than beautiful? Uh, but God is setting up a picture of the gospel, just like the world uh, became a world in which uh, there was the kingdom of God inserted in the world uh, while the world itself became uh, totally under the authority of, or uh, 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 in rebellion against God uh, uh, with Satan ruling over them. Uh, and that was pictured in that pristine uh, situation of a perfect world with a Garden of Eden. Now, the animals... Uh, 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 apparently must have had access there because the serpent uh, came to Eve and we would think that she probably was in that area of the Garden of Eden but the Bible doesn't get into that kind of detail it's not really important to the salvation message that is found there well I guess what my question is is how do we reconcile the dinosaurs with the story of Adam and Eve in the garden Oh, well, that's no problem. You see, the dinosaurs uh, are actually the animals that were living 6,000 years later. Uh, they were all created. Everything was created after its kind on the sixth day of creation. Every animal that has ever lived on the face of the earth had its original parent created at that time. And... Uh, and they existed on the earth uh, after the fall of man. Uh, there were changes. Uh, before man fell into sin, there were not saber-toothed tigers. Uh, there were not carnivorous animals. The Bible teach, teaches that they were herbivorous because there was no death in the world. But when man fell into sin, 
Then God put a curse on this world uh, so that uh, uh, thorns and thistles came up out of the ground and uh, and there were poisonous snakes and and uh, poisonous bacteria and viruses that developed and and finally the reason we know about the dinosaurs is because they are uh, what uh, what uh, was uh, instantly killed by the flood of Noah's day which occurred 7000 years ago uh, they these animals were covered by great great uh, quantities of mud uh, and uh, and uh, under pressure and heat uh, that changed to sandstone and the uh, and the uh, uh, we still find the evidence of their of that of their bones there so that, that we can reconstruct what kind of what uh, somewhat of what kind of animals lived at that time and uh, uh, two of each kind would have been in the ark with Noah and not two full-grown ones and, uh, of course it could be two baby ones but at least to maintain the species and many of them later on became extinct because of the climatic changes that followed the flood of Noah's day. But you are saying that they existed, coexisted at the same time as man? Oh, the animals were created absolutely the same day, the same 24-hour period that Adam was created, the animals were created. Even the prehistoric ones that we, that we learn about that every animal now like I say they were not created carnivorous there were no uh, they there were changes that occurred in the animals once Adam and Eve rebelled against God which would have come some months or years after uh, after they were created but okay th thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. I'm sorry. I lowered my radio. Thank you. Uh, caller on Friday uh, couldn't. Uh, it, I lost his call with you, and I wanted to help him. I, I understood what he wanted to ask you. So may I do that, sir? What, was, what did you think he wanted to ask? Yes, he was um, wanting to ask you about John chapter 20, verse 17. Yes, John. And I know that in the past you have uh, explained that, but of course you always get new Christians. Well, he asked really about John 20, verse 18, not 17. Oh, okay, well... I, I looked it up in the concordance and I found it. Okay. He right. wanted to know why Jesus told Mary not to touch him. Oh, that's not in John 20. Oh, wait a minute. That, excuse me. I, 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 I understand the problem. I was giving an answer out of John 21 and rather I out of John 20. And okay, thank you. And the reason that Mary was told not to touch him is because Jesus was using her as a picture of what the believers were to do now that Christ had risen from the dead. To touch uh, is a figure that identifies with marriage, like we read in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. It is good for a man not to touch a woman, uh, uh, but for this... Uh, to avoid fornication, they they should marry. Now, uh, spiritually, every true believer, typified by Mary Magdalene, is the bride of Christ, and we all look forward to the consummation of that marriage. That is, uh, it's again a picture of the intimacy that uh, that exists between every true believer and Christ eternally, and that won't happen until. The last day when, uh, as the Bible uh, reports in, I believe, in Revelation 19, there's the marriage of the bride and the lamb. So when Mary, when he, she said to Mary, don't touch me, uh, it wasn't a wrong thing for her to do. But he is simply using her as a picture of the body of believers, effectively, spiritually, he's saying, uh, 
uh, believers, you can't have the completion of our celestial marriage until I go to my father. Now, why did, why did he say, till I go to my father? Because earlier on he had said, unless I go to my father, the Holy Spirit will not be sent. And why did the Holy Spirit have to be sent? In order to uh, get on with the, God's task of evangelizing the world. And that is what uh, any, uh, a task that every true believer is involved with. And so effectively he is telling Mary as a representation of all true believers, you, uh, the marriage feast will not be completed, our mar- or the marriage of every true believer in Christ until first the gospel goes out into the world and I have assigned you to be caretakers of the gospel, to send it out into the world. And then when your task is done, then you can uh, be with me eternally as my bride. I say I pray that that gentleman has been listening tonight. Well, also, may I ask uh, may I ask something? Yes. Uh, Exodus 30, 35 verse 3, please. Exodus 35. Okay, let's look at that. Exodus 30 5 verse 3 ye shall not kindle ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day and what I'd like to compare not compare it to but in numbers the man who was gathering sticks yes does this have anything to do with that it doesn't say why he was gathering sticks, whether he was going to have a fire. He had not come to building a fire. He simply was gathering sticks. But okay. You, but oh, I'm sorry. But you could, you, could you explain to me why they were not permitted to kindle a fire on the Sabbath? Well, you see, the fire represents judgment day. It represents the wrath of God. And... and uh, we are not the ones who have anything to do spiritually. Or hold on for just a moment. We're, I'll be right back with you after this message. We have a caller on the line who's asking us about uh, Exodus chapter 35, at verse 3. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh there shall be to you a holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. Now, uh, already to kindle a fire is work that you would have to do. But particularly, a fire has to do it. Whenever you see the word fire or smoke in the Bible, it has to do with God's judgment. Now, The seventh day Sabbath, which is in view here, was used of God as a sign or a portrait of the fact that uh, even as they were, uh, we're not to do any work on that, or they were in that day, not to do any work on that day, so we are not to do any work at all to become saved we have to wait entirely upon the lord jesus he has to do the full work of making us saved now one of the very big tasks that jesus had to do in order to be our savior was that a fire had to be kindled Uh, the fire of God's wrath, which had to be poured out upon him. Uh, And uh, he, uh, that is absolutely required for the salvation of any individual. And it is not for us to think that we are somehow in charge of kindling that fire or of um, managing that fire or, or, or whatever. We know that Christ did it entirely all together on our behalf. And so not only are we not to do any work 
on the Sabbath, that is on that seventh day Sabbath, as they were keeping that ceremonial law, uh, uh, to uh, to indicate that they are not to work for their salvation, but also they are not to uh, get involved with the wrath of God, the, the judgment of God, by building a fire on that day. It's entirely the province of the Lord Jesus Christ to do that on our behalf. Now, once Christ went to the cross, we don't keep the seventh-day Sabbath any longer. Uh, that was uh, uh, the Christ has done all the work to save those that he planned to save. And now God has shifted this Sabbath day to the Sunday Sabbath, which is not a ceremonial day. It is a day uh, that is part of God's moral law so that we are uh, able to have a day of, of uh, focusing all together on Christ and our relationship with him. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, how are you? Um, my name is Andre O'Brien. Um, I love uh, Family Radio. Um, I have a question um, concerning uh, the Bride of Christ. Now, if you could turn for a moment to Revelation 21, uh, 9, if it is. Uh, Revelation 21, 9? Let's, yes, sir. Let's look at that a moment. Revelation 21, verse 9. And there came up unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and so on. Now, what is your question? Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think I just heard you feel the call, and you referred to uh, the body of Christ as the, as the uh, bride of Christ. Is, well, is that correct? Well, yes, the bride of Christ is not a city of brick and stone and mortar. It is, a, it is the bride of Christ is people. Uh, it is the city of God, namely the New Jerusalem, that that consists of all the true believers. We're typified by the city Jerusalem, the Holy Jerusalem, or the, in another place where it's called the New Jerusalem, as we read in verse two of Revelation 21. But it is uh, it is talking about the the totality of all the true believers. Uh, who would become saved throughout the history of the world. Okay, so why is there such a great detail in describing uh, this city in terms... I mean, this is just a... Uh, is, how can I... But you is this see, a figurative uh, section, or is the description of the city to emphasize the fact that the city, that Christ is actually married, going to be married to the city, or it's going to be a union between Christ and the city? Yeah, no. I always find that confusing. Why would, uh, why is the reference of uh, missing the wedding or um, being called to a wedding? If well, we're in fact the bride, would a bride be called to a wedding? Well, first of all, Christ is not married to a city of, of physical walls, and uh, uh, how how can Christ, who is eternal God, be married to a literal city that, of brick and stone and mortar? That wouldn't make any sense at all in the face of it. Secondly, Christ spoke in parables. And when it talks about uh, the 12 gates and, uh, and, the, uh, and the 12 foundations and so on, these are references to the fullness of all the true believers that would come into the city, into the new Jerusalem and the city of God. And, uh, and even as we read, I believe in Galatians already, it says that in Galatians chapter 4, let me see, if it says uh, 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 verse 26, but, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. That is the, the kingdom of God that, uh, that exists in heaven and 
uh, and uh, from which uh, it is the body of believers that have shared the gospel with others. So in that sense, it is the mother of us all, that is, of all who have become true believers. But these figures of walls and gates and foundations and so on are simply uh, further words that have to be understood spiritually relating to uh, the uh, our identification with Christ as his bride. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our... I, I, excuse me, I, I, I will admit this, that in the local congregations, basically, they have a hermeneutic or a method of interpretation that is man-made. It did not come from the Bible. Absolutely did not come from the Bible in which they are taught. Uh, the pre preachers are taught at seminary and they in turn teach their congregation that, uh, that uh, don't look for something spiritual in a, in a sentence in the Bible unless the Bible clearly directs you in that direction. And that is a an altogether wrong hermeneutic. It leaves out great portions of the Bible from having any understanding. The correct hermeneutic, that is the correct biblical method of Bible interpretation, is set forth in Mark 4, for example, where Christ said he spoke in parables. And without a parable, he did not speak unto them. Now, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so any sentences in the Bible that do not direct, uh, in, uh, speak directly about the nature of salvation, we know immediately we are to look for a spiritual meaning. Now, in order to find that spiritual meaning, we have to be careful only to look in the Bible. And when we get finished uh, solving what we believe is the spiritual meaning, of some earthly sentence, some uh, uh, words or sentences that we're looking at, we have to make sure our conclusion is in harmony with everything else the Bible teaches. And if we follow those rules very carefully, we'll find that the Bible opens up like a beautiful flower. All kinds of beautiful truths come flow from it, just like the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, becomes the bride of Christ. And we see their language that indicates the, the beauty and wonder of being a child of God forevermore. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Campy. Yes. Um, God bless you. Um, I have a question here for you. I would like to take a look at Deuteronomy, the first book, verse 2 and 3. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 23. No, no, no. Verse 2 and verse 3. Verse 2 and verse 3 of Deuteronomy chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. There are eleven days a journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. And it came to pass in the fortieth year, in the eleventh month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according to all that their Lord had given him in commandment unto them. Okay, yeah, my, my question is very campy. I heard you with a program, you was talking about the numerical numbers in the Bible, or God didn't, didn't say them for reason and they were comparing. I would like you to um, try to compare that date and uh, with, with November the 1st, 2004. Here we can make a comparing. Well, now compare uh, which with which. Uh, turn your radio off, please. We're getting some feedback. Uh, you want to compare these verses of Deuteronomy 1 with what? With um, um, November the 1st, 2004. This is numerical. Uh, so we can um, 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 make a comparison with those two dates. Um, um, the 40th year, on to the first day, and uh, November the 1st, 2004. So we can make a comparison. 2004? Yeah, November the 1st. 
Well, I don't know anything that happened on two. That's not a significant date of any kind, 2004, November 1. I would have no idea how to tie anything into that. That is, certainly is not a date pointed out in the Bible. I might say this, that Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 2 is a very interesting verse that God has placed here, and we wonder why he even says it. There are 11 days from Horeb by way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. We know that Horeb is Mount Sinai. That's where the law was given. We uh, know that uh, Mount Seir has to do, uh, uh, well, with Edom. Let me see. Uh, and Kadesh Barnea has to do with the uh, place where they uh, crossed over, uh, right close to where they crossed over the Jordan River into the land of Canaan. And uh, now... Uh, uh, I, now I'm going to have to say I have to stop. I'm I'm <laughs> going to get into deep water. Uh, there was a time when I thought I knew the spiritual meaning of this sentence, and now I I haven't looked at it for a long time, and I have to re rethink it, and so I better not uh, try to offer it. But I do believe it is telling us something about God's timetable for the development of the gospel. But I'm not qualified right now to, to speak to it. Okay, thank you Brother Campy, and God bless you, and keep up the good work, sir. Thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening, welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hi, Brother Campy. Yes. Yes, could you please talk about free will, but could you please restrict it not to the gospel message, because I believe the Bible obviously teaches predestination. But free will, uh, I'll, I'll give you specifics, so I, maybe this will help. Uh, Friday you were talking about, someone asked about government, and you mentioned how we're to follow it and, you know, be uh, as the Lord Jesus would be, uh, meek, with, with, unless it goes against what the Bible teaches. So in regards to my question of the free will, you say God does everything perfectly. And I see an incongruity in this respect. Would we say then that there, well, I need to let you speak about free will, but I just want to throw out this. God did, did not raise up, say, a Hitler or a Mussolini, or did he, and all the subsequent horrors. Uh, so anyway, I don't know. Does that help at all? Well, I don't really know wh yes. where you're getting to. You mentioned yes. Mussolini. Well, no, okay. I, where I'm getting to is, can you tell me how far you see free will going in well, daily well, life? Oh, well, where we see men under sin, under under the curse, where we see horror upon horror. Are you seeing God in all of that, that there's no free will? That's, I guess, my question. Oh, no, not at all. Oh, free you. will has to do with, uh, with the idea that I can choose, I have a free will to choose for Christ to be my Savior any time I desire to do that. That is what people talk about as free will. In other words, it's up to me. Uh, it is up to me to, to choose God as my Savior. Uh, now, we have a free will to, uh, uh, to sin. We have a free will to uh, uh, decide what kind of occupation we, we can get into if we're qualified. We have a free will to decide, decide what kind of clothes we're going to wear, and so on. We have a, we have a lot of latitude. But when it comes to choosing for God, we are spiritually dead. We are spiritually dead. We will, and we're in complete rebellion against him before we're saved. So we will never, never choose for him. We're like, I tell you, we constantly uh, go, go back to this, we're like a stinking corpse. We're like a valley of dry bones. These are figures that God uses. And yet there are all kinds of people with their do-it-yourself gospel who insist, no, that's not true. 
there's at least something within us that left of the image of God, even with all our sins. And in fact, God himself gives us some faith uh, so that we are, can make a choice. We can choose for Christ. And that just is not the way it is. We are dead, spiritually dead, and will can never choose for him. No, because we are self-deceived and we're under the authority of Satan, who is the father of lies, therefore we fully believe that we have the truth when we say we have a free will to choose for Christ. But when we search the Bible and let the Bible guide us, we know, no, no, a dead person cannot make a choice. Uh, that is, a spiritually dead person can make a, cannot make a spiritual choice. Brother Camping, pardon me for interrupting, and I, I appreciate the, the message you're giving on the gospel as far as salvation. And I, I, I agree totally with the fact that it's something that we really don't choose at all. It's God's work totally. Uh, I guess I'm not phrasing the question as properly as I would like to. I, I'm talking in this respect. When you share on the radio with all of us that God does everything perfectly, I guess the question I'm putting out here on the free will issue is you, you sometimes have said that God kind of directs our lives and guides our lives. Well, I'm not just talking about people in, in their search for, for, the, for God, I'm talking about in the, just out in the world where things happen. Are, are you basically saying that that is a free will, all of that, when, 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 a, when a Hitler uh, is raised up and a Stalin? Because you, you've quoted that verse about in government, God raises up government leaders. Yes. Does that mean he raised up a Hitler? I guess that's more my question this time. Well, please. Uh, yes, of course, God raised up a Hitler. God raised up... Uh, uh, Mussolini, God raised up uh, uh, whatever, who rules over us. The Bible insists that it is God who who uh, who uh, uh, appoints kings. We read in Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 4, and this is a very particular emphasis, but uh, uh, of, of how God works. We read in uh, mm, in verse 35, and all the inhabitants of this chapter 4, verse 35, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he, and he that is God and doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Or again, uh, that isn't the. Uh, uh, there was another verse that I wanted to give where, where God says that God raises up kings and he puts down kings. I just don't have that verse right at my fingertips here. But That's fine. Can you tell me without quoting the exact uh, verse? Yeah, well, he raises up yes. kings. Yes. And, and so when, yes. when we end up in a nation with a cruel despot of a king, uh, we cannot be in rebellion against him. Uh, as a child of God, we are to serve him. Think, for example, of the, the situation in Daniel's case, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we read about them. Their, the king that they served was Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was used in the Bible as a, as a dramatic type of Satan himself. So he was, a, he was by nature a very wicked king, someone who did not, did not relate to God at all. And yet God uh, placed, uh, raised him up. And God placed Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, these four young men, in his service, and they served him. But they served him only politically and in, in a secular way. They did not serve him spiritually. There was a big distinction. When the time came, when the king 
asked Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to bow down before the idol that King uh, had built, and I wanted all the peoples to bow down before. They refused to do so. And they were told, if you don't bow down, we're going to throw you into a fiery furnace. And they said, fine, O king, you can throw us into a fiery furnace, but we're not going to bow down. And they were thrown into a fiery furnace. Now, in their instance, God spared them, but but they were ready to be burned to a crisp uh, rather than serve this, this, their, in, in, a, in a spiritual way in any spiritual way at all, the king that they served. But politically, yeah, they served him. They were high in the government of King Nebuchadnezzar. So are you saying, if I may please, a a true believer in Nazi Germany, say in 1944, they were to go ahead and follow the Nuremberg Laws, all of the Hitler's decrees, except in a in the spiritual sense, and I guess well, that, that's the end of my question, but I appreciate your answers. Well, but you see, if, 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 if the king asks you to do something that is contrary to the law of God, to murder, for example, then you have to disobey, just like bowing down before this idol. You have to disobey, and you're not to try to... Uh, to start a civil disobedience program going on or try to uh, try to get civil war going in order to get rid of this tyr- this tyr- tyrant of a king you are simply to disobey recognizing i'm going to be punished for this but that's okay that's all part of it i i i want to do it god's way but in other words we are not to rebel against that 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 king at all we are simply to disobey him if we if in so do if obedience would require us to do something that was spiritually wrong that's, that's excellent thanks so much have thank a good you. night thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum yes mr Kenton. yes Yes, I wonder if you can explain uh, Matthew 25, verses 29 and 30. Matthew 25, let's turn to that. Matthew 25, verse 29 and 30. And there we read... For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, what is your question? Well, yes. So, well, I, what is what it is that we have, and what is what is. what it is that we don't have that will be taken away. Well, for example, this is going on today with a fairly well, with a really going on. There's church after church. If you went back 50 years in their history, you would find that they were, uh, they were uh, uh, much closer to being faithful to the Word of God than they are today. They, they had a lot of doctrines that were contrary to the Word of God. But uh, I, let me give you an illustration. Sixty years ago, there were no churches of any consequence that were teaching that you could divorce for fornication. They, were, they had that right, that there cannot be a divorce for any reason whatsoever. And, and that... Uh, therefore, that was a very healthy situation in those churches because the families stuck together and they and uh, and the families uh, and in that one aspect of the gospel, they were being faithful to the word of God. Then they began to uh, make changes, and particularly in this last few de- couple of decades, great many changes have been, and so even. Some of the uh, correct behavior uh, uh, in doctrine and practice of that local congregation, even some of that has been removed. Today, for example, 
uh, in most in almost any church you'll find you can divorce for fornication you can marry again uh, you can divorce for other reasons also in other words what they had is being taken away uh, they used to talk about hell and damnation a whole lot more frequently they were much closer to bringing the whole counsel of God because the whole counsel of God includes not only talking about salvation but also about the judgment of God how can you really talk about salvation unless you know what you have to be saved from today in most congregations you hardly hear anything about hell and damnation what they had is taken away there are churches who which began where they I uh, used to talk about uh, correctly that uh, serving Christ is a spiritual activity and we have spiritual blessing. Oh, hold on, I'll be right back with you. Illustrations we're giving of how God has taken away what people had. And uh, for example, again, uh, uh, there are uh, the churches, used, uh, many of them used to teach that really. The, the real blessing that comes with being a faithful a person in the word of in with in God's kingdom is a spiritual blessing even though we may not have much of this world goods uh, at all today many of those churches have shifted to a prosperity gospel where oh now they're told if you are a child of God you are going to become rich you're going to become wealthy and if you're not becoming wealthy, there's something wrong with your faith, and so on. Uh, incidentally, before we go to our next call, the verse that I was looking for in Daniel chapter 4 uh, is, is verse 17 concerning God raising up kings. Uh, Daniel 4 verse 17, uh, the, uh, where, we, uh, we, where we read that the living may know that the Most High, that's eternal God, ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. Now, the basest means the lowest kind. And so we're not surprised that sometimes kings are uh, of uh, the tyrants that they are, but that uh, God is taking full accountability for that responsibility for that but shall we go to our next caller please good evening welcome to open forum uh, <clears throat> good evening mr camping uh yeah he raised up pharaoh too you know uh, just another verse that shows that that he does raise up who he will my question tonight is uh on the two witnesses and revelations and it speaks of two witnesses i think it's in ezekiel Revelation 11, yeah. Right, and, and Ezekiel, I, I believe it's Ezekiel uh, in the Old Testament, uh, it speaks about the two witnesses there, too, that, uh, the two olive trees that constantly pour out oil. Now, wouldn't the two witnesses in Revelations be God and, and uh, Jesus? Is that what oh, no, the two there? Wit no, the two witnesses, the number two, uh, we find as we go through the Bible, we find that the number two signifies those who have been made caretakers of the gospel. Uh, and uh, throughout the church age, the, the local congregations were the caretakers of the gospel. The two witnesses that were killed uh, in Revelation 11, it says they were the two olive trees. Uh, they were the... Uh, 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 they were the... Let me turn to that a moment. Uh, they they were the uh, they were the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And and you see, uh, as witnesses, we are the light. We bring the light of the gospel to the world. And these this is talking about the true believers in the local congregations who now have been killed. That is, they've been driven out. They've been silenced. So they can no longer witness within the congregations. Uh, and if they were not driven out, they were commanded to come out because uh, the, the, the God indicates that the, uh, test, their testimony has been finished 
within the local congregations. Um, one other thing that you were just explaining about uh, marriage and the church and uh, you know how they taught, uh, it's not just that one thing, but it's all truth. Huh? I mean, there's, there's very, I, I mean, I listen to them on the radio, TV. I don't go to church anymore, but when I did, there's, there's very, very little truth in there at all. It seems well, like he's taking the truth out of there, you know. Well, you know, as, a, it. as a matter of fact, you hear ministers, evangelists now, and they hardly quote from the Bible. They are talk about everything except the Bible, and yet they're coming in the name of Christ. And, and, it, and it, it's not getting better, it's getting worse and worse that way. Because that's what Matthew 25 teaches, that what they had is being taken away from them. All right, thank you. Thank you for calling and share, sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome Hello. to Open Forum. Hello. Hello. Go Hello. ahead with your call. How, how are you doing today? tonight, uh, Mr. Camping. Very well, thank you. Uh, I uh, I have a, uh, I would first like to say that, uh, I would like to say this, please, if I could. Uh, oh, God is light. Oh, God is love. Oh, God is life. Uh, I would like for you to go to Deuteronomy 6, 11 through 15. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Yes, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, 11 through 15. Let me look at that. Please. Genesis, Deuteronomy 6, 11 to 15. There we read. Uh, let me begin with verse 10. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full. Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him, and shalt swear by his name. You shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee, and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Now, what is your question? Well, I would like for you to expound on that a little bit, please. Well, you see, God here is talking about the nature of salvation. Uh, salvation brings everything. He's using a fig a fi the figure of a city where the houses are already built. There's olive tree groves. and In other words, there's food and water and plenty of plenty of, uh, uh, everything is there that is necessary for having a wonderful, wonderful life. And that is the nature of salvation. When we turn to the Lord, when we, the Lord opens our spiritual eyes and we become saved, we have everything spiritually, not physically, but spiritually. We have God himself to indwell us. We are, he will never leave us nor forsake us. We, uh, he is there always to care for us. We're all, we can go to him again and again for wisdom. And when we die, we leave our bodies and go to live and reign with him in heaven. We have everything going. But the problem is, a lot of people see these things and they want to get there on their own steam on their own program uh, they want to have all these things and as a consequence they're not really doing it God's way they're doing it their own way and they think they're getting these blessings when in fact uh, they are still under the wrath of God and and eventually they will be destroyed from the face of this earth they will have to stand before the judgment throne on the last day be found guilty, and will be cast into hell. I have one more, please. 
Yes. Uh, one more verse. Um, I think, uh, let me see, let me see, Psalm 89, 1 through 5. Psalm 89, 1 through 9. 1 through 5. 1 through 5. Psalm 89. Let's look at that. 89, verses 1 through 5. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, Mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. Now, what is your question? Uh, Could you just elaborate on that? Please. Well, this is simply talking about the wonder, uh, the plan of God's the, salvation. I'm trying to get the deeper meaning. The, yeah, the, well, you the see. The meaning of it as I, as I possibly can. I'm, in verse 3, I have made a covenant. That is, there is a law. The word covenant means law. Uh-huh. God has established a law with my chosen David. Now, David that God has in view here is not David who reigned as a king 3,000 years ago over Israel. He was typifying Christ. Christ is in view here. The word David means beloved, and Christ is the beloved one. I have made a law with Christ. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Now, in order for thy Christ to have a seed, and remember in Galatians chapter 3, that those who are the true believers are the seed of Abraham, who is the seed of Christ. In, in other words, the seed of Christ include all of the true believers. And, and uh, uh, his faithfulness is available to all the peoples of the saints, all those who have become saved. He's calling them the congregation, that is the total assembly uh, and we come to Christ one by one, and yet the, 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 uh, eternally it's a great congregation, a great assembly of true believers that will be with Christ forevermore. Oh, oh, oh yes, uh, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me say these two quick things real quick. Uh, I, was, I was wondering if there was any way that you, you had thought about maybe like putting a paragraph or two or three in, say, like a uh, big newspaper or something that talked about the uh, 2011 coming of uh, possibility of Christ coming back. And uh, uh, no, it's it's a very big subject, and and you can't do it in a paragraph, and certainly. Uh, it uh, would not be understood. Uh, we actually have to wait upon God. Now, we're uh, maybe someday, it hasn't happened yet, and I don't know if it will happen or when it will happen if it does happen. Someday the media is going to want to talk about this. Right now they are in total denial. They know they know what we're teaching on Family Radio. They know very well what we are teaching uh, and because we've been around for over 40 years and, and uh, we, we cover a whole lot of cities of the United States and, and we have informed the media indeed of a lot of the things that we are teaching, but they are in total denial. They don't want to face it. You have to bear in mind that this is a subject that is as distasteful as any that you can imagine, that indeed the judgment day is almost here. And every human being, whether he thinks it out or not, deep in his heart knows that there is a judgment day coming. 
Yeah, God, he is created in the image of God. The Bible tells us the law of God to some degree is written on his heart. He knows that there is a judgment day, but it is an unacceptable thought. And therefore, they don't want to talk about it at all. Now, okay, well, whether God will ever open that up uh, through the media, I don't know. Okay, well, let me, let me, this is the last one. Um, I know that the what you said a long time ago about the flood was in uh, 4990 B.C.? Yes. Did, did you say it was in 49 B.C.? The flood was 4990 B.C. Okay. Okay, that's what I, that's what I said. Okay, well, uh, if you go back from forty nine ninety all the way to back to creation, what what time around? If you go back to a date of time, when would that have been? Well, we we do have the whole calendar of time. It began in the year eleven thousand and thirteen B.C. Yeah, and six thousand and twenty three years later, we have the flood. And so on. We, uh, uh, if you get get the book "Time Has an End," which is available free of charge from Family Radio, the whole time. Okay. Well, I've already read. I've out. already read the book, and I really enjoyed it a lot. But um, I, I, I'm just I keep reading my Bible and, and and listening to you as much as I can at nighttime and part pretty much during the daytime too. And I sure have learned a lot. Mr. Campion, and well, just keep... I, I just want to thank you, and, and, and you sound really strong, and, and I, I pray for you every night that, that, you'll, that you'll continue in, until whenever the Lord comes back. That's, that's, my, that's my wish for you, and, and, uh, and I pray for your, for your staff and, and everybody and, and hope everybody is going to be protected and guarded. And um, well, thank just you. hang in there, Brother Campion, and, and, and keep doing what you're doing. And... and uh, uh, Good night. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, can you go to the book of Hosea? You're looking at the book Hosea? Yes, sir. Uh, chapter 8. All right. Let's look at that. Hosea, chapter 8. And which verse? Hosea chapter 8. Hello? Yes, Hosea yeah. chapter 8. Yes. Uh, verse 11 through 14. Because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin, altars shall be unto him to sin. I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. They sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings, and eat it, but the Lord accepteth them not. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They shall return to Egypt. For Israel hath forgotten his Maker, and buildeth temples, and Judah hath multiplied fenced cities. But I will send a fire upon its cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. Now what is your question? Well, back when I was in the church, uh, real deeply, I used to always be taught, this is talking about the nation of Israel. And recently I left. Um, but the fact is, this is talking about our day. Ephraim yeah. is a picture of, uh, in, in the Old Testament, it externally was a picture of the representation of the kingdom of God. Throughout the New Testament era, it is the local congregations that are a representation of the kingdom of God. And this is talking about uh, what's happening in our day. And uh, Ephraim, that is the local congregations, they have made many altars, but not altars, that is spiritually speaking. They have set up many doctrines and ideas that they claim came from God, but actually they are serving their own ideas. And, and God will remember their iniquity. They shall return to Egypt. Now, Egypt is a figure of being in bondage to sin. 
and and the local congregations are definitely in bondage to sin because they have forgotten their maker and and uh, they have uh, uh, and therefore i will send a fire upon his cities and it shall devour the palace in other words it's speaking about our day judgment begins with the house of god uh, we're in that day of judgment and it has begun and it is seen most dramatically in the local congregations as we find that they are uh, that God is not utilizing them anymore to save anyone in verse 12 uh, I have written for him the great things of my law that's the Bible right I have written to them the great things of my law but they were counted as a straight strange thing yeah that's a that's a very pertinent verse you know I, it, it, I, I, I often ask this question. If somebody claims to be a true believer, and in every congregation, those who are confessing members say, oh, we are true believers. Now, what is the characteristic of a true believer? Someone who loves the law of God. I delight in the law of God. And what is the law of God? The Bible, the whole Bible. And therefore, if they are true believers, you would think that as we <coughs> learn more things about the calendars of time and about uh, how God is working today and so on, from the Bible, it all comes from the Bible, you would think that all these so-called true believers in the local congregations would would uh, be fascinated and interested and and want to know more and more. Oh, is that what the Bible says? Uh, I'd like to know more about that. But you know, it's a strange thing to them. They don't want to hear. They say, we have peace and safety. We believe we're a child of God. All those other things you're talking about are unimportant. Uh, we are safe and secure in Christ. And they, they, uh, the fact is that uh, the Bible is no longer uh, of, of importance at all. It's uh, the only a few verses that they are utilizing to prove that they are a child of God and they've, and they've uh, read them wrongly. They've been taught wrongly as to what those verses are teaching. And that's what they're trusting in. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, I'd like to talk to Harold, please. This is he, and you're on the air. Thank you, pardon? You Go ahead. You're talking to him, and you're on the air. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Harold? Yes. What do you want to talk about? I, I want to know how do you explain, you're talking about the local congregations, the churches, how do you explain when there's churches that have as many as 43,000 people attend each Sunday? Uh, these ministers, they are, they don't tell, when you go to church on Sunday, they don't tell you a bunch of fish stuff. They, are, they come to you out of the Bible, teaching the Bible. And uh, it bothers me uh very much that uh, people, thousands of people are attending the, attending churches. You got like Dr. Billy Graham, uh, this fellow from Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, the guy from Houston, Texas. Yeah. Well, you see, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Here comes a, and I'm not thinking about any individual now, I'm just speaking in general, because this is true of, of uh, in, all through the whole church world. Here comes a man who speaks very loving, uh, very kindly, uh, very uh, comforting. Uh, he, uh, he is preaching from the Word of God, from the Bible. He absolutely insists that the Bible is the infallible Word of God, and that's all that he trusts. And so he establishes his credentials to all those who listen to him as truly being a servant of God. 
But then, because he himself is deceived, he doesn't do this with malice of forethought. He thinks he is bringing the truth of what he has learned. He begins to teach what he believes the Bible is teaching. For example, a very common doctrine is that Christ loves you and that uh, he has paid for the sins of the whole world, all the sins of the whole world. Now, the congregation listens to that. Oh, that's wonderful to know. And it's coming from the mouth of a child of God, a preacher who is steeped in the word of God, and he's coming in the name of Christ. But what they, what what the congregation doesn't know is that what that preacher or that evangelist has just said about Christ paying for the sins of everyone is not true. It is a big fat lie. It is something that the Bible does not teach. You mean uh, that that the pastors, the ministers, are are telling us people who go to church every Sunday, have Bible study and this and that, that he's telling us lies? Well, now you see, the, the role of a preacher, now let's back up a minute. The role of a teacher of the Bible is to be an instrument in God's hand to faithfully declare the Word of God. They do. Well, now excuse me. Uh, and therefore, we can test whether they are so doing by the Bible itself. We don't have to go to school or go to seminary in order to test that. We can test it ourselves. Yeah, For example, when they say that Christ loves you, and then the Bible says that God hates the sinner, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? That's from the mouth of God, and God has the last word. Well, I, 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 I just, I, I, I know you're, I know you're a man of God, and and you know the the Bible back and forward and upside down and everything else, but these 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 ministers, these pastors, they they're not going to get up in front of a big congregation and, and tell them a bunch of lies? Well, excuse me, we're, we're abhorred by this. It's a terrible thing. But that's exactly the way it is. All right, you, you, uh, because you see, and we can test it. What All, I'm going to do Sunday, or I'm going to call, call my pastor up, and I'm going to say, Pastor, are you telling me a bunch of lies every Sunday when I come uh, to... Uh, what will be his answer? Come on. I love the Lord. I know the Bible. I am anointed by God to bring the Bible. Would I tell you a lie? Absolutely not. Well, that pastor doesn't know he's telling a lie. He's teaching what he has been taught as to what the Bible is saying. But neither he nor his teachers have checked out carefully enough to really know what the Bible is teaching. And so it ends up as a lie. I'm sorry, we can't visit longer on this, in our, uh, but I have to say good night. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.